All right, everyone. Good afternoon again and welcome. Thank you for joining me on this lovely Friday afternoon in um, the summer. <laughs> I appreciate anyone being able to pop in um, this time of year and this time of day on a Friday um, to sit through an hour and a half webinar. So thank you so much for being here. Um, for those of you I've not had a chance to meet before, um, I do see some familiar faces in the chat and in the group, but for those of you have not met before, um, hello, my name is Casey Prince Harvey. Um, and I am here today with my lovely ELA team to talk to you about narrative writing for high school. So for English one through four, um, I'm going to go ahead and get us started on um, a little bit of our housekeeping. Um, introductions starting out. So again, Casey Prince Harvey, uh, I'm Education Associate for Humanities, um, and then I also do ELA support. My background is teaching high school English, so this is um, my favorite place to be with my favorite people to be with. So I'm very excited um, to be with here, be here with you today. I have um, my partners on the ELA team. I have Brenna McCormick, who is our secondary ELA education associate, and Mandy Hawker, who is our elementary education associate. And we are all here today to support your work in the classroom um, and to get to know a little bit more about you. So before we jump in, um, if I could just hear in the chat, or if you want to unmute, um, tell me who you are, where you're coming to us from, and um, something fun you have planned either this weekend or in the coming weeks for summer. Would love to hear what you have going on. Let's take a look. I want to see Lexington High School. Lawrence. Ooh, a road trip. That sounds exciting. Some vacations coming up. Ooh, a tennis tournament. That's awesome. Love that. Wedding reception, bridal shower, baby shower. You are very busy, Carla. Oh, my goodness. That is... One of those is enough, I think, for the entire summer, especially if you're having to do any sort of planning or preparation for it. Oh, I see whitewater rafting in Idaho. Whoa, that sounds fun. A get together with extended family. Teach full time for virtual SC. What else we have here? Kayaking, two weddings and a reunion. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Visiting family in different states. That sounds exciting too. Oh, state parks. That's cool. Are you going to try, Stephanie, are you going to try and hit all the state parks? You're going to do, uh, is it the Ultimate Outsider Challenge? Is that what it's called? I see Bahamas. Anniversary, hanging out with the kids. Love that. Going to the lake. Um, Y'all summer sound way more interesting than mine. <laughs> um, but I love that. That's very exciting. Oh, that's the plan. Gotcha. Yeah. Very, very cool. Oh, yeah. Brenna just took her kids to their first state park and they had a blast. I saw lots of pictures of lots of fun things that they were doing. That's fantastic. Um, well, we uh, have not done anything super duper exciting, except our team moved into our new building this week. So we are um, officially in our new SCDE building out at the State Farmers Market. Um, so this is our first webinar that we're ever hosting in this new space. So we are um, navigating some of those changes and you know they're still building a couple of things, putting some things together. Um, but that's been our excitement today. So anywho, keeping up with our housekeeping, I'm going to move us forward with our landing page in attendance. I think Brenna dropped it in the chat a little bit earlier, um, but she's going to drop it in again. So um, the attendance for today is linked on there. And then the landing page is going to have all of your resources for today. And I've linked all of the resources from our last two sessions on our other two modes of writing for the ELA standard. So we had a session already on argumentative writing and then a session um, 
what was that last week on informative expository writing. So all those resources and the recordings um, are also on the landing page if you want to go back and take a look at any of those things there. Um, one additional reminder, um, kind of the same thing that we've talked about before as we're going through these examples um, in these sessions for writing, we provided some instructional practices and some example ideas of things that you could um, take and adapt or use for your um, for your lessons and for your kids. Um, but in addition, um, please make sure that you also are consulting your high quality instructional materials. I think we had some discussion about that maybe last week. So um, as part of your textbook adoption, you should be getting new instructional materials this upcoming school year if you have not already gotten them um, at your school. But just make sure you look through those materials as well. And then our examples here in instructional practices are, are a supplement or support to those materials. Um, so just make sure you're consulting those as well. All right, um, the fun thing here um, that many of you already know um, is that we are happy to announce that we are now offering one hour of recertification credit for every hour of webinar participation. So this is our first time um, this summer that we're able to do recertification credit. Um, and we have three requirements for receiving the recertification credit. So the first one, um, which you're already doing, you are attending the webinar live and you are actively participating through the chat, through some of the different engagements. Um, remain in attendance for the duration of the webinar. So make sure you filled out um, that attendance form and that you kind of stay in throughout the session. And then making sure that not only you complete the attendance form, but also at the very end, we'll have a feedback form. Um, and those are unique to each of these sessions. That's how we kind of record that end piece. Um, and from there, we're able to um, send out that recertification credit to you um, at the end of the session. So just make sure you have all the links that you need. If anything um, comes up during the session where you didn't have the attendance or the feedback form or anything like that, just let us know and we'll be happy to drop it in the chat for you. Okay. So getting to today's purpose. Our purpose for today's session is to enhance understanding of the expectations for narrative writing for secondary students and provide instructional strategies to support students' ability to develop real or imagined experiences using effective techniques, which is really the language of that standard for narrative writing. And we're going to dive into the nitty gritty of narrative writing for high school, um, which tends to fall a little bit by the wayside in favor of argumentative and informative and expository writing. So I want us to bring that narrative back, have it sit beside our two other modes of writing, and then talk about um, one of our major shifts in narrative writing for high school, which is the incorporation of narrative into other modes of writing. So we're going to hit all of that today. So if this is our purpose, then what is the why? Why would we take an hour and a half on a Friday in the summer to talk about narrative for high school? So drop in the chat, why, why do you think this is something to take some time out and have some discussion around together? Um, can I just speak? Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, I teach um, all levels of English. I'm the only English teacher for Rock Hill Virtual High. And I also teach creative writing. And from the years that I've dealt with creative writing, that is the, the assignments that I give that are tailored to personal experiences. I try to do them kind of like mid-year because too early on, the kids are not ready to really reveal anything about themselves. But, but I gauge where they need to do that at. And it has really opened up the classroom, even though it's virtual, even in face-to-face. -face, it, it just gives a sense of family when you mm -hmm. allow that type of writing um, in your classroom. And you learn so much about your students. They learn so much about you. And it just helps with any other curriculum that is to follow. So narrative writing is the way to just express how you feel, still learn standards, still learn the basis of writing, but that expression, that outlet, they need that. Absolutely. And I'm looking in the chat as well. So, of course, building and reinforcing all types of writing. Um, absolutely. And we'll, 
as we get in a little bit and talk about those other modes as well, it's that reminder that um, just because argument is called C1 in our standards and informative writing is called C2 and narrative is C3, that doesn't mean that's an order of importance, right? That they're of equal importance in our standards. Um, telling stories is a skill we need in our daily lives, helping students build creativity. Um, students read narrative writing, but don't often get to practice it. Yep, absolutely. Tends to be looked at as a more elementary writing type, helps them find their voice, that reflection. Oh, building on that metacognition, right? And that's such a like fine-tuned nuanced skill that when we get into high school, it's so important for students to have. And narrative is one avenue for doing that. Many aspects of storytelling, building confidence, enhanced writing skills, often replaced completely by analytical writing. Yep. So I'm I'm seeing a lot of those same pieces here. Um, that hopefully we can um, sort of narrow in on and really uh, talk about that what and that why, and then how it relates to our standards and what that could look like. So I'm very excited for us to, to share a little bit about that today. I want us to start with a quote um, from Reeves Collins. It says, storytelling is among the oldest forms of human communication. Storytelling is the commonality of all human beings in all places, in all times. And I want to start with that because we all chose to become English teachers for different reasons. Um, among those reasons, many reasons, um, there are likely two common threads. The first being a love for teaching children and the second is a love of story, right? We could have chosen to be any kind of teacher we wanted to be, right? But that that love of story pulls us in. Um, personally, I'll never forget being in an undergraduate English class like on Shakespeare's tragedies with a summer course that I took. And um, I remember being a student in high school and having to read those plays. And I watched the movies, I did the essays and all those things. And I never really truly understood the meaning, meaning behind any of it. Um, but when I was in that class finally, and I was listening to my professor talk about Macbeth and talk about his relationship with Lady Macbeth and their power dynamic, um, something finally, finally clicked for me. And so I realized while I couldn't necessarily relate to the historical context or even the language at times, I could connect to the feelings and the motivations of the characters. And that was like a huge moment for me. And then I wanted to make sure that I could share that same experience with my students. Um, so when I taught Othello in um, my English 2 class, for example, the students might not be able to relate to the time period or the language, but they definitely understood what it felt like to be betrayed by someone they thought was their friend, right? Um, and stories do that. They connect us across time and place and all sorts of different contexts. Um, so that's why it's really, that's kind of my why behind talking about storytelling. And I would love to hear from you as English teachers in the chat. Um, what are some stories that you love and love to share with your students? I'd love to see what we got going on here. To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, I see Mary put Shakespeare too. I Yeah, love Shakespeare. Brenna with the book Thief, yep. Edgar Allan Poe, Percy Jackson, oh my gosh, yes. Antigone, Knight, yep, mm-hmm. The Odyssey, Macbeth, Fahrenheit 451. Oh my gosh. Oh, these are coming in quick. <laughs> oh, The Lady or the Tiger. Oh my gosh, of Mice and Men. Oh, so many good ones here. Oh, I see Mandy, she put, oh, Sounder. Mm-hmm. The Outsiders. Gatsby, Poe. And it doesn't even, I see, you know, short stories in here too, but just something that like, that clicks for you, that um, hits your heart in just the right way, things that you love to share with your students. I want us to keep that in mind. Um, that, oh, the yellow wallpaper. Yes. Oh my goodness. So many good ones here. Oh, the most dangerous game. 
So we all have our reasons. We all have our our stories that connect us, our stories we want to share with our kids that connect them. I see the house on Mango Street. Um, Brenna and I talk a lot about Eleven, this, the vignette Eleven from the house on Mango Street. Oh my gosh, so many good things. Um, all right. Well, keep that in mind. Keep that love of story in mind as we continue on and talk about narrative writing. Before we start, we're going to do our little pulse check that we do at the beginning of each of these sessions um, just to see where we're at at the beginning and then we'll come back to it at the end. Um, our hope is no matter where you rank yourself, hopefully we can move you up at least a degree um, no matter where you're at. So I'm going to give you a couple of statements. And as I give those statements, if you would please rank yourself from one to four, one being strongly disagree, four being strongly agree. So let's see our pulse check. Our first piece here, I thoroughly understand the expectations for C3, which is narrative writing, for my grade level or levels. So let's see where we're at today. Okay, I see some threes, some fours, some twos. Okay, we've got a good mix. Excellent. And again, no matter where you're at, my hope is we can just move up a degree, right? An hour and a half is not enough time to become an expert in anything, um, but can we pull something away that's actionable and move you a little bit up on, on that spectrum? Oh, I just saw someone put hatchet. Oh yeah. Excellent, okay. Second statement, I'm confident in my ability to teach students to write narrative texts. Okay, I see some threes, three, four, 3.5. Okay. Excellent. Okay, see some twos. Fantastic. So again, good mix. Next statement. I have a variety of narrative writing experiences to pull from when asking students to demonstrate and or practice their learning. So do you feel like you have a good bank of resources? You could see a good bit of fours and some twos, some threes. And again, that could be totally dependent on your experience. It could be dependent on, yep, if you're talking about the old standards, maybe you developed resources from the old standards or you had instructional materials that were um, really geared towards narrative writing. There's no one right or wrong answer, but hopefully we feel like after our session today, we can move up at least one degree. So fantastic, love to see the variety of experience here. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and get started by looking at narrative writing and our 2024 South Carolina College and Career Ready ELA standards. First off, talking about modes of writing, um, we've gotten that question um, in some of our previous webinars before with what do we mean by modes of writing? What are the modes of writing? Um, so as it pertains to our ELA standards, um, I'm pulling the definition here directly from our glossary. And so these are types of writing that are used to address different tasks, purposes, and audiences. And each mode has unique structures and techniques for expressing ideas. These are also known as modes of discourse. In our 2024 ELA standards, we have three modes of writing, those being argumentative or communication one, informative slash expository, communication two. And we've had two webinars on those already, um, and you've got the recordings on your landing page. Our last one is going to be communication three, which is narrative writing. So that's the one we're focusing in on today. When we look at um, that actual language of the standard, we see it's writing narratives or write narratives to develop real or imagined experiences using effective techniques. But what is that? What does that mean when we say to write narratives? Um, and again, we have a definition from our glossary, and the glossary is linked on your landing page as well. Narratives, as defined in our glossary for our standards, would be writing that tells a story, often using devices such as plot, structure, narrative, characters, dialogue, sensory details, and figurative language. 
narrative writing can be based on real or imagined experiences. Um, so of course we could be writing a fictional story or we could be writing some sort of personal narrative or statement. Um, and then when we look at our explanation of strands, um, which is a piece in the front matter of our standards document, we can see a little bit more information that goes in depth on narrative writing. Um, so what I wanted to point out here Again, is that real or imagined experiences piece. The use of a variety of narrative text structure. So that could be poetry, that could be prose or verse or prose, dramatic structures, and um, the emphasis on intentional organization and stylistic choice. Um, so really what that means is it's an opportunity to be really intentional with style and voice, which we may not necessarily get in some of our other modes of writing because we're more focused on being objective. The expectations around narrative writing and writing in general will become even more clear in the grade level entrance statements. So in our standards document, each grade is introduced using an entrance statement and it provides a general overview of what learning will look like at that grade level. So each of those um, ex or grade level entrance statements is going to have a section on communication, so written and oral communications. Um, and specifically, there's going to be information on writing and some examples of ways in which students can write to demonstrate their learning across the three modes. Um, so what we're going to do to start us out is take a look at some of those grade level entrance statements for English 1 through 4. So in the chat, um, Brenna added the English 1 through 4 grade level entrance statements. We're going to take about five minutes individually to explore um, those grade level entrance statements. So I would say you just start out with one, but if you want to look at more than one in that five minutes, you're more than welcome to. But um, open up to one grade level, could be a grade level you teach or a grade level you support. Think about how writing and especially narrative appears at that grade level what ideas for instruction around narrative writing um, are presented in that grade level entrance statement, and then also consider how you could use the statement to support planning and instruction. So I'm going to leave these instructions up. Um, we'll take five minutes individually. You're welcome to turn your camera off for five minutes or whatever you want to do, but open up the E1 through E4 grade level entrance statements um, document, and then um, search for your grade level that you want to explore first. Okay, we'll come back at 127. We are right around the halfway mark. 
little bit less than the halfway mark. So we'll come back in two minutes. Right, go ahead and start closing out um, your thinking around the E1 through 4 grade level entrance statements. And as you do, I would love for you to either drop in the chat or unmute um, a little bit about, tell me a little bit about uh, what grade level or levels you looked at and what you noticed. Could be about how narrative appeared, any sort of instructional implications, ideas that you had. Um, just let me see. What stood out to you? See, Carla said English 2 students begin incorporating narrative into other modes. We used to see examples. Yep, to introduce an idea or support a claim, narratives can be long or short. Yep, I definitely see the focus on tone and style. Ultimate goal is use of all modes with mastery. Oh, great point, Jessica. English 1 students need strong foundation in reading to develop as a writer, they need to experience the quality stories to know how to write their own. Serve as strong mentor text for examples of how to develop tone and style. We know that's so important in narrative writing in particular. Yep, starting in English 2. Amber, I love the way that you're phrasing that. Um, emphasis on using narratives as a tool to make other writing more effective. Should be creative, rich, and challenging for their audience. Semi-autobiographical narrative. Writing anecdotes as part of narrative within other modes, potentially. application of universal theme. Absolutely, I love that. Everything that y'all pointed out is so on, so on par um, with what I was gonna share. So um, as I go through, I just wanted to hone in on a couple of pieces here. Yep, um, English 1 students focus on a tone and style that's appropriate for their audience. They could write multi-paragraph essays, text-dependent writing, creative pieces. They could be also writing, um, and especially as we move into those later grades where they're incorporating narrative and other modes of writing, those professional emails, personal letters, public service annou announcements, editorials, some of that college and career ready writing um, is also incorporated there. Academic discussions as well. We want students not only um, writing, but then also performing and speaking and listening as well. Same thing here. Right, a lot of the same information, um, except for that incorporating narrative within other modes of writing is that big key piece here for English 2 in particular, and that shift 
from English 1. We also see some examples here of personal statements, cover letters, and resumes as part of your um, college and career ready writing. And again, some of that is going to incorporate that those narrative elements. And then again, same pieces here that you pulled, some of those examples of how students could show mastery of their writing. Um, again, they are incorporating narrative within other modes of writing. So they start that in English 2, they do that through um, English 4. And then same things. All right. So I didn't want to go too much in depth on that because a lot of what you had in the chat spoke to what I shared there. Um, but why don't we do a little reflection before we move into sort of the vertical articulation of narrative writing? We're going to do something called mirror microscope binoculars. So um, for this reflection, just on this first part where we looked at the entrance statements and we got an idea of the explanation of strands and what narrative writing is, um, I want you to reflect either using mirror, microscope, or binoculars. So for mirror, consider what misconceptions have been clarified or new learning experienced. For microscope, think about what you might still need to take a closer look at. And then binoculars, looking ahead, how will information from this section impact student learning? So pick one of those three, and if you would drop that in the chat, just to let me know where we're at before we move on to um, vertical articulation. Binoculars, long and short narratives, oh yes. And that's going to fit so much into our um, discussion of micros, minis, and macros a little bit later. Mm -hmm. With the microscope, just looking at the differences in English 1 through 4, seeing how narrative writing is presented in each. And we'll do a little bit of that in this next section. But definitely going back just sort of on your own and getting into the, the real details there um, is a great next step. Closer look at mentor text with narrative used in argument or informational text. Looking for a variety of ways to develop narrative skills. And just that in general, right, that incorporating narrative into other modes of writing. Microscope, what does that look like in English 2 through 4? Hopefully we have a little bit of an idea by the end of our time today. Yep. See. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The misconception cleared up that narrative writing can be a variety of forms, doesn't just have to be a story, right? It doesn't have to be a fictional piece. Um, we can have characters that are real people. That use of mentor text, just looking at a different or looking closer at the standards in general, prose and verse. Yep, thinking about it through poetry. We'll look at a little bit of poetry today as well that vertical alignment. Oh, and then that college and career ready writing, talking about those personal and professional types of writing and that narrative can fit within those if students are making intentional choices about the techniques that they use. Excellent. All right. Well, fear not, we will be discussing some of these as we move forward when we look at the vertical articulation. So um, let me go back here. So the first thing that I want us to do, um, I'm going to have Brenna put in the chat the vertical articulation just for that narrative communication three standard. So it's going to have um, the vertical articulation for all of those levels. And as we take a look, you'll be able to keep this and do a deeper dive if you want. But as we go through each of those levels, what I want to do is show you the previous level and then the current level. So we'll have eighth grade on one side, English one on the next, so we can see where some of those shifts are. Then we'll take English one and put it next to English two and talk about some of the shifts and so on and so forth. Um, so what I've done here is put those side by side and tried to highlight some of the language that shows 
the major shifts from grade to grade. So um, it is important to note what I have on here um, is sort of the, the summarization of the communication 3.1 actual vertical articulation. So you're going to see all of those sub indicators on the link that Brenna put, but here I've kind of summed it up for you with some of the major pieces. So it's not going to represent the complete indicator. Um, it's not going to highlight every single difference between every level. It's just drawing your attention to some of the key differences in expectations from level to level. So make sure um, you do go back and take that deeper dive. But for our purposes today, we're just seeing a couple of pieces. So I would love to see what stands out to you when we're looking here at eighth grade versus English one. What are some of those key differences um, that stand out to you? Okay, from logical to intentional, the introduction of problem, absolutely. Anything else? Establishing a problem or a conflict? Yep. So, yes, we can see in English one, um, moving from eighth grade, uh, we're focusing on an intended purpose for writing. Uh, we're also now not only establishing a situation or a point of view, but also a problem. So we need that, you know, emphasis on conflict and understanding what conflict is. Um, there's also a shift from transitional words and phrases and logical plot structure in eighth grade to just a clear progression of experiences or events. So. Focusing in a little bit on some of those shifts, a couple of pieces that are worth pointing out here in terms of just instruction. First would be um, to use the glossary as a support. Some of that language and the shifts in language, you'll be able to find definitions in our glossary that are aligned to the intent of our indicators. Um, our glossary was crafted specifically to align to our indicators. Um, so it's not just like pulled off of different dictionaries and kind of cut and paste, right? They're crafted specifically to align. Um, so you could um, clarify indicator language through our glossary like author's purpose, task, figurative language, and some different types of figurative language, point of view, and also pacing. Um, again, because students will establish a problem in their own writing through narrative, uh, we want them to be familiar with the different types of conflict to do that. Um, conflict itself is introduced in fourth grade, so it's not going to be a totally unfamiliar term to them, but now that they're using it in their writing, um, when they're writing narratives, we want to go back and make sure that they have an idea of what conflict is and what different types of conflict could be. We want students to continue to intentionally use narrative techniques like dialogue and pacing, um, so that's not that's not changing. That's a, that's a skill that they're going to continue to use. And then while it's no longer explicitly stated, in eighth grade it was, in, in English one it's not, um, we want students again to continue to use logical plot structure and transitional words and phrases that link their ideas or sections of text together. Um, but, you know, of course we're calling it here in English one just a clear progression of experiences or, or events. They do that through the logical plot structure and through their transitional words and phrases. All right, English one to two. Again, take a look here at some of those pieces and um, add to the chat what stands out to you and what that might mean for instruction. Oh, Jessica, I love what you said. From this could happen to I made these choices in my craft on purpose so that these things would happen in my text. That is the key. Yes, it's all about that intentionality. Yep, I'm seeing the other modes of writing, supporting a claim, supporting claims through narrative. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, that's another piece here that I have in red, right? So students were establishing a situation or setting up a problem in English one, but now we've added observation as well, which could be a part of um, that argument or that informative writing that they're now using with their narrative writing. Narrative is anecdotes, the relevance. Yes, intentional use, absolutely. 
So um, yes, the intentional use of narrative within other modes of writing, either to introduce an idea or support a claim, for sure. Um, and it's again about that intentionality. And then think also at the very end with that conclusion, that your conclusion connects the narrative's relevance to the purpose. Why would I build a story into this argument or into this informative or explanatory or expository piece, right? What is the why? What is the so what? So, Again, when we say other modes of writing here, we're including argumentative and informative slash expository. Those are our two other modes of writing from the standards. Again, you can use the glossary to clarify indicator language, such as modes of writing and what's included in those, um, style and task. Uh, when it comes to our other modes of writing, in the grade level entrance statements for all those grades, but in particular here for English 2, you'll see like there was a section on narrative that gave some examples of how, how students could demonstrate their mastery, but there will also be a section on argumentative and then informative expository with examples. So you wanna take a look back at the grade level entrance statements to see the different ways that students can demonstrate their mastery of writing in all of those three modes. And then here, which someone hit on earlier in the chat, students need experience reading narrative within other modes of writing in order to replicate it in their own writing, right? Um, what is it our, our friend Angie always says? You, you have to know something to do something, right? Know something we, to learn something. Yeah. Know something to learn something, there we go. Um, so we wanna make sure that they have that experience and they have, like you said, those mentor texts or those examples that they can look at. So I'm gonna get on a little bit of a soapbox here, so forgive me, um, but I wanted us to really pause and focus on that major shift in English too, which is incorporating narrative in other modes of writing. What I'm including here is going to be um, the indicator insight that comes along with that indicator. So it says narrative within other modes of writing refers to the inclusion of a narrative excerpt or anecdote and other forms of writing, so argument, informative, et cetera. Um, it's important to talk about the why behind that shift, why we would use narrative within other modes of writing. So the first thing that I wanna say is that um, as students progress through their K-12 education, some of you hit the nail on the head earlier saying that narrative sometimes falls by the wayside in favor of argumentative or informative writing. Um, narrative, sometimes can be seen as less academic, um, but it's important to remember that all three of those modes are listed in our standards K-12, right? The expectation is for students to write in all three of those modes. And again, just because argument is listed as C1 and informative is listed as C2 doesn't mean that's an order of importance, right? Narrative being C3 doesn't mean it's the third most important of the three. Um, because we know the ability to not only tell stories, but to intentionally interweave them into our arguments and informative, informative pieces strengthens communication. Um, it's a natural way that we communicate in real life. Um, and I wanna emphasize that with a quote from a book that I've been uh, referencing and reading to, oh yeah, it does go back. Carla, you're on to me. You're on to me. Um, I want to go to this quote from Story Matters, which is a book that I've been using to prepare for this webinar. So it's all about using narrative in other modes of writing. And it says, the truth is effective writing must embrace all of it. A student writer should understand how to use the modes of argument, narration, and information, not as discrete arrangements exclusive to other patterns, but as a smorgasbord of delivery methods used in the service of communication. Attorneys do this. Yes, they absolutely do, right? This is the natural way that we communicate. Um, so I hope that this kind of helps to interweave that why. And I'm going to use an example here. So let's consider this. We have two introductions to two argumentative essays on poverty and homelessness. Imagine that both are being shared with the same audience for the same purpose and will have similar claims. One that's on the left is going to take the more traditional approach. It's going to move directly into establishing the claim. The other uses a story to personally connect and then lead into the claim. So if you were to choose, which would you be more likely to read? Ah, 
I would agree. Probably the second, probably the one on the right, right? It begins with that personal story. And I'll be the first to admit that as a high school English teacher, I was definitely guilty of telling my students not to use I in their writing. Right. I told them that it diminished the credibility, it um, weakened their points, but we know that those opportunities to engage your audience through intentional storytelling when partnered and grounded in solid evidence makes one's argument or information more enticing to read, just like we see in this example. Oh, Jessica, bringing up the five dysfunctions of a team. Oh my gosh, I love it, I love it. Yeah, and I'm seeing so many of you say here, this is how people communicate in real life. This is how we see attorneys. This is how we see the um, some of the best speakers and writers of our time, right? Really influential people interweave story into their arguments and into their informative writing. So I'm gonna circle back like Carla said, cause she was on to me, to our quote here, right? Stories build human connection. They engage the audience. They connect them to the task and the purpose of the writing. Um, they create buy-in. It's exactly what I did at the beginning of this session by telling you my story about being in that Shakespeare class and my love of Shakespeare, right? That was, that was kind of that why behind it. Um, stories and intentionally chosen narrative techniques can align to the larger goals of your writing. Right. So my first goal in starting the session with a story was to foster connection within this group, because I love to see the things that you love to teach and why you love to teach them. But also I wanted to really make sure that we consider the importance of narrative and storytelling in the high school English classroom. Right. So as we move forward through these next few grades, um, I want us to really consider that the use of narrative within other modes of writing is an opportunity for students to be intentional about the choices they make as writers in order to impact their audience. And as the expectation in English 2 shifts to that narrative within other modes of writing and then into English 3 and English 4, it is both invitation and permission for students to engage with and connect to their audience through their writing. So to share stories and use techniques they may not have previously considered because we've kind of boxed them into this is the argumentative pot, this is the informative pot. We'll have, you know, a little bit of narrative on the side if we have time for it. Um, so really making sure that they think about the intentionality of those techniques in those other modes. Um, this is also going to be a shift in thinking for many teachers who may have set narrative to the side or relegated it to a single unit of study, right? Um, so considering that shift in thinking. I'm going to step off of my soapbox now <laughs> and move us on to English 2 and 3. So when we take a look here, English 2 and English 3, um, we still see write an intentionally used narrative within other modes of writing, but what new pieces stick out to you in English 3? Yep, establishing the significance of the problem. Absolutely. Yep, those details and the intentional details too, right? Again, yeah, the why does this matter? Everything here is is shifting into intentionality, right? It's it's again that I'm doing this for this reason. Introducing an issue leads to, yep, could be as part of a debate or a larger argument, opportunity to personalize the issue. Yep, again, that significance, that attention to detail, all of those pieces. So it's that refinement of that work, right? We're not seeing necessarily a new introduction to brand new content, but we're really fine tuning those skills. So same thing with English three, as we said with English two, we wanna to refer to the grade level entrance statement. Um, we can see examples of how students could demonstrate their mastery. We know informative writing could look like this and argumentative writing could look like this and narrative could look like this. So here are some ways that I could build those together. Um, students should make intentional choices about what details to include within their narrative. Again, the, I did this because, 
And then by establishing an issue, um, this gives students an opportunity to create an intentional call to action as part of their writing as well, right? What is that next step? And same thing we've said, provide opportunities for students to articulate the why behind their writing. Um, in one of the examples that you will see in our micro mini macro in just a few minutes, I um, one of the activities that they do at the very end is create almost like an artist statement for the choices that they made in the piece that they create. So it's that metacognition. Lastly, our English three and four shifts. Just take a quick look and see what um, what draws your attention here? Amber, I love what you put here. Using narrative is more than entertainment. Bring attention to issues and causes. Change catalyst. See, pre precision of vocabulary and language. The emphasis on tone. And if we were to synthesize all of that, it's again about that intentionality, right? We're refining and fine tuning. We're emphasizing voice. Yeah, and from phrases to language. Yeah, there's a sense of totality there. That's going to incorporate all of those previously learned pieces of information around um, words, phrases, figurative language, all of that. So same thing, um, use the glossary, glossary to clarify indicator language like tone. Words and language includes all previously learned concepts from earlier grades, that includes that figurative language. Um, so again, not too much of a change, but again, it's that intentionality and that refinement. So we're gonna wrap up this section with what I call one word. So um, if you would drop in the chat, just one word that describes your thoughts or feelings um, about what we have just discussed. Clarity, opportunity, integrated, connections, excited, that makes me happy. Intentional, fresh, knowing this is great oh i love that the wow <laughs> change identity excellent comprehensive fabulous i love this okay well these seem po this seem uh positive <laughs> i was hoping uh we wouldn't get anything um Super negative, so that makes me happy. Weaving together, absolutely. It's that synthesis, right? That we hope students get to. We hope students get there by the time they leave us. <laughs> Connected, excellent. I see Dawn has her hand raised. Yes, I just wanted to say really quickly, the give some reference behind the wow. I have, for all of these years that I've been teaching, have always looked at narrative writing as just an easy starting point for students. And it just clicked today that it's not just an easy starting point for students, but it's a building block. And I never looked at that. I never looked at it that way until this session. And it just really clicked that, oh, wow, narrative writing can be used in all other types of writing. And that's probably why we started with it in the sixth grade and teaching middle school versus just it, it's easier to teach. So mm -hmm. it's just mind boggling to me. So thank you so very much for this. Of I course. just kind of 20 years in I, and, and I finally got it. Oh, that made my day, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad I was. I my major hope was that we could just see narrative as having a seat at the table next to our other modes. Um, and that just sort of really was a full circle for me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we are going to now talk about the actual practical application of this, right? Because we had a whole lot of discussion just now. We, we looked at um, some of those shifts, but how do you do that? What does that look like? Um, 
And the first thing that I want to point out, we're going to talk about this through micros, minis, and macros. That's what I've called it, micro, mini, and macro experiences with writing. And before we do that, we're going to talk about um, writing in general by starting out with this. When we looked at that vertical articulation, when you pulled up like that C3.1, where did it say in the language of the standards that the final product that a student turns in to demonstrate their mastery had to be an essay? It does not. That is correct, right? Trick question. There are no indicators in our new ELA standards that say explicitly a student has to write an essay to demonstrate their mastery. Now, <laughs> please hear me say, that does not mean that students should not ever write essays, right? But what we're saying is that there's more than one way that a student can demonstrate their mastery. Um, what we kind of are calling it is that it's not a no, it's a yes and. And I want to talk a little bit about that um, and then jump into some examples. So um, let's start by looking back at that explanation of strands. That was one of those things that um, Brenna put in the chat earlier. Um, when you look at the explanation of strands, you will see that like here, for writing, for argumentative and informative expository writing, it will give some examples of like what that could look like. So we see here um, could be speeches, presentations, paragraphs, letters, um, exceeding the boundaries of a written essay, right? It's explicitly stated there that student writing can exceed the boundaries of a written essay. Then when we look at grade level entrance statements, so like those ones for English one through four, you got some examples of ways students could demonstrate their mastery. So I'm pulling one here just from sixth grade. Um, says students can write shorter or longer narratives. Um, they could write summary paragraphs, multi-paragraph essays, text dependent writing, professional emails, personal letters, again, beyond those bounds of a written essay. And then at the grade level indicators, even, we see um, that language. So here I'm pulling a third grade, um, C2.1, informative expository writing, where it says write informative slash explanatory pieces. And then there's an indicator insight that says informative pieces can include, but are not limited to, essays, brochures, pamphlets, projects, infographics, right? So lots of different ways that students can demonstrate their mastery. And why is that? Well, let's look here. This is the English 4 argumentative writing indicator language. So this is the end of learning expectation. Your students are about to graduate and go off to whatever their next step may be. The end goal is to write arguments. And then in the sub indicator, that sub indicator E, it says establish and maintain a writing style appropriate to the task and audience. Right. And that expectation is actually embedded across the three modes, and it begins as early as middle school. And what that comes down to, like we've said over and over, is the intentional choices that students make as writers when they're creating their pieces. And in order for them to understand um, that they're how to do that and like different ways you can address a task and what that tone and style could be and what your audience may be, they need to understand there's more than one way to address a challenge or a task, right? They have to have ample experience writing in different ways for different purposes for different audiences. So we can't necessarily have just one way that students demonstrate their mastery. Um, and that actually supports our overarching expectation one, um, which is to read and write for a variety of tasks, purposes, and audiences. So again, it's that yes and in terms of essay writing. So when we show our examples in just a minute, you're not going to see essay examples. You're going to see other examples of ways that students can demonstrate their mastery. But that doesn't mean that um, they shouldn't write essays, right? There's a time and a place for, um, for that. And when we go back to our profile of the South Carolina graduate, it outlines the vision for the knowledge, skills, and characteristics for students um, who've completed their K-12 education in South Carolina. I mean, think about all the different ways that writing and communicating across different modes for different purposes and audiences supports that profile, 
right? Um, so there's not anything there that says, you know, the world-class skill is a five paragraph essay, right? The, the world-class skill is communication or critical thinking and problem solving or creativity and innovation. So one instructional practice that can support authentic writing in all three modes is the use of micro, mini, and macro writing experiences. So these are experiences that invite That's students right to engage in shorter and more extensive writing opportunities over time. Um, they can be used throughout an entire unit of study. They can be connected to one topic or text, or they could be introduced as individual experiences and adapted across the three modes. Um, our webinars that we've done over the last few weeks on the three modes have come with examples of micros, minis, and macros. So we're going to do that same thing here um, today. And again, on your landing page, you will have the recordings and the resources from the other two webinars. So as a refresher, micro experiences would be writing experiences that are less than one class period. Many experiences are one to two class periods, and then macro experiences would be your culminating product. So that could be a written essay. It could be um, a, a larger scale written piece. It could be a written piece in combination with a multimedia. So, um, but just a culminating product for them to demonstrate their mastery. And I'm gonna kind of go through this piece. Um, fairly quickly, but just addressing before we move into the examples that um, there's a difference between instructional strategies and writing experiences. So what we're talking about with the micros, minis, and macros are writing experiences versus the instructional strategy. So with an instructional strategy, the teacher is the facilitator versus a writing experience where the student is the facilitator. Um, the instructional strategy would be a planned method or approach used by the teacher to deliver instruction and facilitate learning. Whereas the writing experience is the specific task, activity, or project that students engage in to practice and develop those skills. Purpose of the instructional strategy is to enhance the teaching process and make it more um, effective and efficient. But the purpose of the writing experience is for students to have the opportunity to apply those techniques in their learning. Examples of instructional strategies would be things like direct instruction, collaborative learning, and graphic organizers. And then the writing experience would be something like essays, research articles, journals. So uh, all of that is to say that um, most of the micro, mini, and macro experiences are writing experiences, not instructional strategies. So students will most likely still need to receive the explicit writing instruction. Um, and of course, there are times when it's okay to teach through the experience, right? You let them try it and then you name it afterwards, but just be careful not to neglect the actual instruction that they may need to have before you give them the writing experience. So that's just a little disclaimer before we talk about some of the examples. And we're gonna do an English 2 set today. So I'm gonna show you an example for English 2 with a micro, mini, and macro experience. And then we're gonna have time to explore the other grade levels. So a micro example, one to two, or sorry, less than one class period would be something like lead writing. So um, what we have here, a, a lead, like an L-E-D-E -E or an L-E-A-D um, would be like an introduction in like a journal, like journalistic writing or article. So you would introduce the concept of a lead to students, um, give them some possible types of leads, um, the why they're important to news stories, give some examples. Um, and then what you're gonna do is provide students with an image that doesn't have a caption. You're gonna prompt students to consider the five W and one H questions. So the who, what, where, when, why, how behind the information in the image, um, and then collect their answers with a graphic organizer. Then once they've created their answers to each of the questions, they'll select what they think is the most impactful or important information, and then use that to create a lead using like whatever information it is they've selected. Um, and you'll explain there that, um, there are different types of leads that achieve different purposes. 
So this would be an activity that, again, is less than one class period, and it's going to hit that C3.1B, just the subindicator B, which is engage the reader by establishing a situation or setting up a problem or observation and establishing its significance. So just that one piece that we're getting practice here with by writing a lead. And you're going to have this, by the way, in the folder that you're going to get in just a moment. I've edited it way down just so it fit on the screen, but you have the full example, like the full activity with the graphic organizer. So I'm giving you like the quick summary. A mini experience would be a data story um, for English too. So this is writing and intentionally using the narrative within other modes of writing. And I picked data story because English 2 is also when um, students are introduced to incorporating data in their informative writing. So we're taking that use of data and we're taking that narrative and we're combining them together. So what this might look like would be providing a set of data for students to review. And I've put some examples, I think, in um, the, the full thing in the folder. Um, but I used, I think, the World Happiness Report. There's like a graph about like trends in baby names over the last hundred years. So any sort of set of data that you want students to look at. Um, use some guided questions for them to explore the data. Um, and draw out specific details or information. So consider patterns, information that sticks out, or if there are outliers, um, information that interacts or connects to other pieces of information. And then from there, they're going to use that information from the guided questions to create what we might call a one or two paragraph story around the data. So what is the why behind the, the trends or the patterns or the outliers that they notice? And I, again, have an example for you in the folder. Um, this is just the abbreviated version. And then um, once they have crafted the data story, they review what they've written. Um, and then they could use that to develop a topic that could be further explored, right? So it could be a starting point for further research. Our macro experience could be a TED Talk, right? We know our TED Talks. Uh, many of you are familiar with them, have used them in your classrooms, I'm sure. Um, and it's going to be similar to the example from last week with informative writing, which was a news story. The difference, though, between a news story and a TED Talk is TED Talks incorporate personal stories in order to engage their audience. Whenever you've seen a TED Talk or shown a TED Talk, you would know they usually begin with some sort of personal anecdote. Um, it could even be characters that are introduced that are, you know, real people, but we're developing, developing them as characters. So you would begin your macro experience by introducing the concept of TED Talks to students, discuss their purpose, what their structure is, give some examples, um, and then have them select and research a topic of personal interest and create a three to five minute TED Talk style presentation. So their final product would include like a written script, the mul any multimedia presentation, and that's going to hit on some of our other communication standards as well on creating multimedia and then also presenting information. Um, and then that final performance with an audience that could include other students in the class or a larger audience. After that presentation, you would allow time for peer review, and then the other students who are serving as the audience would provide feedback on the speaker's message, how they used narrative or narrative techniques to advance their message, and the effectiveness of the choices that they made, which again is another communication standard um, for oral communication. So that's going to be on evaluating um, the ideas of others. And that's again going to hit our um, write and intentionally use narrative within other modes of writing. And I love that. Wouldn't it be awesome to give the students a platform that extended outside of our classrooms? Yes. And that was one of the um, suggestions that I had in the full strategy um, in your folder, which would be um, including classes, other classes, parents, teachers, or community members um, and doing it. You could even do it as a full, you know, school event or as a town hall. Absolutely. So that was a very quick overview of what a micro, a mini, and a macro could look like for English 2. Each of those is taking some sort of information or argument and interweaving that narrative or narrative techniques, right? And one's going to be a very small one that's just hitting one sub-indicator, but then your macro is going to be something that's going to incorporate 
possibly multiple indicators, right? You're going to have some informative writing and you're going to have some narrative writing and you're going to have some oral communication um, and multimedia presentation. So um, gives you a lot of bang for your buck there. But um, that was a lot of me talking. And what I want to do is give you a good bit of time to explore. So um, in just a moment, Brenna is going to drop in the chat a folder that has micros, minis, and macros for all three, um, sorry, all four, <laughs> all four grade levels. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so what we're going to do is take about 10 minutes for you to explore the additional experiences. And as you do, you're welcome to look at anything you want um, from any grade and any micro, mini, or macro, doesn't matter what length, it's entirely up to you. But I want you to consider how you could use any of those activities, which you can share. So could you share it with your department or could you share it with, um, you've got a brand new teacher coming in and you're going to be their mentor and maybe they need some some ideas or some examples. And then which could you adapt? Which could you maybe it's at one grade level, but you might need to shift it for another grade level or, um, you know, it's a really great idea, but you have this unit that you do. Um, so think about how you could adapt it. So about 10 minutes, it's 2.10 now. We'll come back at 2.20. And when we come back, I'll ask that you share any of your ideas that you could use, share or adapt. Okay, so 2.20. Oh. For anyone just joining us, we just dropped in the folder for our micro, mini, and macro examples. We're going to review those different examples. We have about now about eight minutes just to explore. And then we're going to come back at 2.20 and share how we could use, share, or adapt any of the information in the folder. I see a question about poetry and narrative writing. In English 3, I created a, I think it was a mini example on creating poetry with two voices using um, two nonfiction texts on the same topic with authors with different perspectives.
We're about at the halfway mark. And I'm seeing some great ideas already in the chat. Feel free to drop those in as you are um, reviewing the examples. And then we'll come back to them as well in about four minutes. Just another minute or so. Oh, Mary, I see you're not, you said you're not feeling well. Brennan's whole family's sick. I'm starting to feel a little sick. So <laughs> it's that summer cold time of year, I think. Right. It's just about time to start adding your information, if you haven't already, um, to the chat. Let me go on over here. And think about that USA. So what's an experience you already know you can use? You could just take and, and it could fit right in with what you do already. Um, an experience you want to share with a colleague, um, and then an experience that you know you can adapt and make it useful for your instruction. So maybe you already have something that you do with your kids. You've got a unit that you already do, and now you can take this piece and you can adapt it for those purposes. I'm seeing adapting using the soundtrack for English One. Students could write a personal memoir, book of poetry. Um, I'll tell y'all about my, I used to do the sound, This, these are lessons, a lot of these are lessons from my classroom. Um, I used to do the soundtrack of my life with my English One students. And uh, I, the very first song they would always do is the song that was number one on the day they were born. And there's nothing that makes you feel older than them saying the song that was the number one song on the day they were born is something that you listen to like in high school and college um, or as an adult. 
<laughs> I think I got like 10 gray hairs just reading someone's soundtrack once. <laughs> Casey, share yep. the example of the data story and the name that you shared with us when you were previewing this. Okay. I just loved it. Yeah. So um, one thing that I found really interesting when I was when I was building these out, right? Um, so I was trying to find different sets of data that could be examples that you could use. That's why I found the World Happiness Report and then the baby name Trends. So I started looking over time at like certain names that were popular in one decade versus another decade. And um, one that I found, and this could be an interesting one for a data story, is that the name uh, Ted was really popular until about the 1970s. <laughs> um, and then when you think about um, some really infamous people with the name Ted <laughs> in the 1970s, it's like, oh, that, that would explain why that name dropped in popularity. So there is a little data story right there where students might have to do some digging. Why did this go from here to here? Um, and what story can I find? Yep, absolutely, Mary, hit the nail on the head. Uh, I, I love that some of you have mentioned TED Talks and that you've used TED Talks and uh, ways you could adapt the TED Talks. Um, I love that you love the haunted house <laughs> activity. Um, how can you sell a haunted house and make it appealing to um, potential buyers? Excellent. The, so the poetry in two voices, um, I pulled that one with informational text um, because typically we, you know, we write poems in two voices just based on, you know, literature or based on a character. But if we're taking something and having to look at perspectives and informational text and then adapt that, you know, we're narrowing down that information, seeing where their perspectives are different and where their ideas might connect or, or intersect and using that to create um, the poem in two voices was just like an extra level of complexity, I think. Um, and Jessica, I love that you um, saw that I adapted the witness statement. So when I was in the session last week um, and heard some of that discussion in the breakout rooms for the middle level session, I was like, "Ooh, how cool would it be to take this and kind of adapt it and make it work with using narrative within other modes of writing. Um, so I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you caught on that. I tried to build things off of what y'all said. Examples remind you of blended learning and UDL. Thank you, Mandy. New teacher sharing the concept of micro, mini, macro when lesson planning. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. All right. Well, I'm loving your ideas. I'm hoping that, um, you know, if you if there's something here you saw that you liked, feel free to go back to it and save it. And one additional feature here that I'm adding that we're not going to we're not going to really dig into um, a whole lot right now, but it's it's something that um, you're welcome to use if it is helpful to you. Um, Brenna's going to pop in the chat a blank slideshow. So this blank slideshow, what I did was I took um, all of the different modes and all of the different grade levels and I broke them into micro, mini, macro, and it's just blank. Um, but what you are welcome to do is use this as a place to share ideas with one another. So I've given you some ideas here, but maybe you've got something that might be, you know, worth sharing with someone else. Maybe you've got a little partner in this room and you're both teaching English one for the first time and someone else in the room has been teaching English one for 15 years and they might have an idea that could help you. So um, if you find that you have any ideas or suggestions for micros, minis, or macros um, for any of the three modes of writing, now that we've done the sessions on all three modes, feel free to pop them on that slideshow and go back to that for, for your sharing and collaboration. Um, but yeah, that's just an additional resource. Brenda has it in the chat for you. Um, and it may be something helpful to even take and build out with um, with your departments or your team as well. So that's going to take us to our clarity and closure. Again, our purpose uh, was to enhance understanding of the expectations for narrative writing for secondary students and provide instructional strategies 
to support students' ability to develop real or imagined experiences um, using effective techniques. Again, that's the language from our standards. And in the chat, I would love to hear from you about how we met this purpose today. Hopefully you feel that we met the purpose, um, but I would love to hear um, anything that comes to mind about how we met the purpose. Okay, instructional strategies to support students' abilities. Information about new ways to incorporate narrative writing, the vertical alignment. Excellent. And let's do our quick pulse check again. Said we were gonna come back to this. Hopefully we can say that um, in our first area, thoroughly understand the expectations for narrative writing at your level, that you may have moved up um, a degree at least. <laughs> and if you were already a four, maybe you feel even more equipped now. All right, are we feeling confident in our ability to write, teach students to write narrative text? And I'm not seeing any twos, so that's that's good. That's a step in the right direction. And then do you feel that you have a variety of narrative writing experiences to pull from when asking students to demonstrate and practice their writing? Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right. So um, two things, number one, um, love a webinar on creative writing. I'll put that in my back pocket, Felicia. Um, so first, this was the third um, mode of writing session that we have, but this is actually a full series that we're doing this summer. So the first session, um, I did just general micro, mini, macro, what those are. Then um, we had two sessions, on one on argumentative, one on informative writing. Then we've got this one on um, narrative writing. And then coming up in July, we have um, sessions on grammar and conventions, um, as well as improving writing. So revision and editing. That's going to hit our first five standards in the written and oral communications strand. So the ones that directly um, deal with writing. So the registration link to our summer webinar series is in the chat. If you wanted to sign up for those last two and you hadn't had a chance to yet, um, that is still open. We would love to have you. And then last but not least, of course, is our feedback form for today. Um, your feedback, um, of course, is a part of the um, uh, recertification credit process that just lets us know that you were here for the entirety of the session, but also it gives us really valuable feedback on um, the relevance and the actionability of our session and anything that we can do to improve moving forward. Um, we do really take your feedback into consideration and like to, um, you know, improve where we can to make sure that what we're putting out is um, the best for the field. So any feedback you have would be greatly appreciated. Um, I am Casey Prince Harvey. And um, so when you check, just make sure you check my name. My email is right there on the um, on the screen if you ever have any questions. And then um, in about a week, maybe a few days, uh, we will get the recording back for this session. I will send it out to everyone who registered along with the landing page with all the resources, all those previous recordings, um, as well as the slides for today. So other than that, once you have um, completed your feedback form, you are good to go. Um, and we're gonna listen and linger for a few minutes if you have any questions or, or anything else like that. Um, but but otherwise, I hope you have a great rest of your day and an excellent weekend. Bye, y'all. I have a quick question.